How can we use technology to improve restoration? Part 5. New Technologies in Oyster Restoration The North Lab at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences Horn Point Laboratory is involved in various projects to investigate new technologies that may aid oyster restoration. All of these technologies involve investigating one of the most challenging aspects of oyster biology, the larval stage. These include computer simulations to track larvae, an image analysis technique we use to identify oyster larvae we collect in the wild, and a shell materials analysis technique that gives us new insights into the life's larvae lead in the wild. My name is Elizabeth North, and I'll be talking about how we can use computer simulations to enhance oyster restoration. Here's a map of the Choptank River with the Harris Creek Sanctuary oyster reefs highlighted in purple. With a computer simulation called an oyster larval transport model, we use the circulation patterns of the river to predict where the oyster larvae are going to go. So I'm going to start the animation right now. And the purple dots are the veliger, oyster veliger larvae, and you can see them being pushed back and forth by the tides and distributed throughout the river. As they disperse, once they become petty veligers, they search for suitable habitat, and the ones that are green uh, successfully land on an oyster reef. The ones that are orange don't make it and die. So we use this information to determine how the Harris Creek Sanctuary can spread oyster larvae throughout the Choptank River. And here's a map of that. The larval transport model predicts that the Harris Creek Sanctuary will likely export oyster larvae to Broad Creek and the lower and middle Choptank River. So the dots represent oyster reefs and are color-coded according to their encounter success. So the ones that are orange and pink represent places where the Harris Creek Sanctuary will export a lot of larvae and benefit not just Harris Creek Sanctuary, but the entire Choptank River, or at least the lower river. The larval transport model also predicts the transport success of each oyster reef within Harris Creek Sanctuary. And it predicts that some of the reefs in the Harris Creek Sanctuary would have greater than 90% transport success. That means that over 90% of the larvae that don't die of other causes are in a position to settle on a reef somewhere in the system. These reefs would be very good for jump-starting oyster populations in the Choptank River. Many factors are involved in choosing sanctuaries and restoration sites within sanctuaries. Some of them include the adult populations there and their possibility for survival dependent on disease. Also the availability of suitable bottom and the cost of prepping the bottom for each individual oyster reef. And the ease of enforcement to keep poachers from theft of the oysters once they start breeding in the sanctuaries. The larval transport model predictions are just another one of the factors that can help choose restoration sites within a sanctuary and actually has been used to help choose restoration sites within Harris Creek. Hi, I'm Jake Goodwin, a PhD student in oceanography at the University of Maryland. Currently, I have sampling efforts underway to help map out distributions of oyster larvae in the Choptank River. We're trying to gain an understanding of how factors like temperature and salinity alter the distributions and abundances of oyster larvae annually. One of the biggest challenges we face is identification. Oyster larvae are microscopic and there's a lot of other plankton floating around out there. We have to sort them out. Even after they are sorted out, they look like other bivalves and fish eggs. Bivalves include clams, mussels, and oysters, and they all have microscopic larval stages that look similar under the microscope. Can you spot the bivalve in this photo? We use a technique called Shelby to distinguish oyster larvae from other things and to categorize them from other bivalves. Each bivalve species has a unique pattern that is emitted by its shell so that we can use pattern recognition software to identify oyster larvae and other bivalves. It is much like the software the FBI uses to recognize human faces on their computer systems. With Shelby, we can recognize oysters among clams, mussels, and other things. We can then look at our collected field data to see times and places where oyster larvae are abundant, which allows us to evaluate the spawning success of various reefs. Overall, we will gain a much better understanding about the life cycle and behavior of oysters. Scientists at the Horn Point Laboratory and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, are using a special technique called Raman spectroscopy to study the shells of larval bivalves like oysters. 
This involves a special kind of microscope that uses a laser to determine the material composition of a specimen based on the vibrational energies of the molecules that compose it. When we view a spectrum from a bivalve larval shell, we see that it contains peaks from a calcium carbonate mineral called aragonite, as well as peaks due to organic pigments in the shell. These pigment molecules may stabilize the mineral in the shell, and they can be considered somewhat similar to a plant-based pigment such as beta-carotene. Recent studies have found that oyster larvae contain a spectrum that is unique from any other species tested so far. If this holds up in more rigorous analyses, Raman spectroscopy may be another useful method for identifying mystery larvae from plankton samples. So the information we can gain from this analysis is to learn more about the formation of larval shells, which is helpful because many places are now showing acidification, which harms larval shells. It can also be useful in identification alongside the image recognition technique. And also, if pigment patterns are specific to the location the larvae are spawned in, we may be able to trace origins of larvae back to sanctuaries. As we come to a close, let's review what we've learned about oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. The problem for humans is that we have lost a food source, lost livelihoods, and alongside that, jobs and boats, and there's been a loss of culture and traditions. The problems for biology are that without oyster, the system loses prime habitat for other bottom dwellers, water quality is reduced, and sediment builds up on the bottom. This then results in a completely changed system. One of the solutions to this problem is restoration. Restoration involves partnerships between organizations to make this happen. State-of-the-art hatchery production and planting spat on shell to reefs to give oysters a jump start to survive, creating sanctuaries to protect oyster habitat for years to come, and involving the community in gaining support for these important programs. We also learned how we can apply more knowledge to restoration plants. This will allow us to better optimize locations for survival of both larvae and adults, and also preserve and protect big fecund females. Finally, we explored some new research that can aid oyster restoration. This includes computer simulations to track dispersing larvae, image analysis using polarized light to identify oyster larvae and plankton samples, and shell materials analysis to investigate unique pigment signatures in larvae using Raman spectroscopy. We would also like to thank our Booz Allen volunteers who came out for a day at sea to learn about how we sample for oyster larvae and sample water properties, such as light penetration using the Secchi disc seen here. For those of you who didn't get a chance to participate, there are still many other options to help aid oyster restoration. These include volunteering with organizations that restore oysters by participating in programs or attending one of their many festivals, becoming involved in oyster gardening if you or someone you know has waterfront property on the bay, saving your oyster shells so they can go back in the bay to be used as substrate for reefs, and of course donating to one of these organizations. All of the programs featured in this webinar have websites and Facebook pages, so we encourage you to check them out and learn more. The future of oysters and the future of the bay rests in these programs as they work alongside science. Hopefully we can continue to improve the bay for ourselves and for future generations.